All right, guys, so I am officially back from Chicago. Obviously, I wasn't able to post on the channel over the last week or so because I was at the DNC. Now, there's a lot that I could say about my personal experience there, but just to give you guys a quick top line view of it, it was all over the place. You would have some good speeches from guys like Sean Fain of the UAW or John Russell of More Perfect Union. You would have weird situations where it would be like Bernie Sanders immediately followed by the former CEO of American Express. You had Republicans who got on stage. You had people on stage praising Ronald Reagan at the Democratic National Convention praising Ronald Reagan. You know, you had people taking hard right immigration stances. And um, I think just overall, it was like, okay to decent on domestic policy issues, but on foreign policy, it was extremely hawkish, extremely hawkish. Now, of all of the people who spoke on stage, there was one notable exception here, which is that the DNC did not allow, they outright refused to allow a Palestinian to speak on stage. So Jon Stewart over at The Daily Show recently called this out. Let's go ahead and watch this clip here. And then I'll give you a little bit more of the backstory. They had black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, gay Americans, Jewish Americans, Palestinian Americans. Oh. Well, oh, to be fair, it was only four nights, eight hours a night. So, again, to remind you guys, we had... Republicans. We had Trump's former press secretary. We had a war criminal on Epstein's flight logs. We had anti-immigration -immigra border sheriffs. We had another cop who appeared on stage. We had the former CIA director. We had the CEO of a bank, again, American Express. We had an Uber executive, and we had Israeli representatives. But who was not allowed to speak was anybody who thinks that uh, massacring children is bad. Now, the backstory on this is even more insane than you would think that it was. Because I think there's a lot of people who had this warped view that the reason the DNC did not allow a Palestinian to speak on stage during this multi-day, multi-hour event was because they thought the Palestinian speaker was going to get up on stage and they're going to trash Joe Biden, they're going to trash Kamala Harris, and um, it was going to be a you know distraction or a sideshow or whatever the case may be, even if those critiques would be entirely reasonable and, and fair and accurate and all of that. But the reality is that if you guys remember, during the Democratic primary, you had hundreds of thousands of people who voted. These are Democrats. These are not outsiders. These are not protesters. These are Democratic voters who said, we cannot stand by as our party is funding, arming, giving diplomatic cover for a genocide in Gaza. And so people by the hundreds of thousands voted uncommitted, right? And so because there were so many people who voted uncommitted, they actually won delegates to be able to send to the DNC. And so I actually got the chance to go out and speak to some of these delegates, these uncommitted delegates, who um, were outside of the DNC. And it got to the point where they were having to do a sit-in protest directly outside of the convention center because the DNC would not allow for a even a state representative in Georgia, in my home state, who happens to be Palestinian American, to get up on stage and give like a five minute speech that, by the way, importantly, it was a pre-written speech that the DNC was given, and it was a speech that didn't even attack Kamala Harris. It didn't even attack the Democratic Party. If anything, it attacked Donald Trump and was an endorsement of Kamala Harris. So even though the speech from this Palestinian American Democratic representative who was there to potentially speak on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of uncommitted voters, even though it was a pre-written speech, they knew exactly what she was going to say. It was going to be an endorsement of Kamala Harris. It was going to attack Donald Trump. It wasn't going to be massively disruptive or anything like that. And if anything, it represented the actual base of the Democratic Party and their views when it comes to Israel and Gaza right now. And they still, they still would not allow a Palestinian American to speak. So just some background here from the Rolling Stone in terms of the speech itself that the Democrats did not want to be aired. So they say the movement's voters, uncommitted movement's voters, could be especially crucial in a state like Michigan, where more than 100,000 Democratic primary voters checked uncommitted. 100,000 votes in Michigan, that could easily decide the state. 
Okay, whether it goes to Trump, whether it goes to Kamala, 100,000 votes could easily be the difference there. So you would think that maybe like the Democratic Party would take that seriously. But they would say, oh, maybe we need to go and earn those votes, right? But they say the DNC has provided several untelevised forums to the uncommitted movement, but has refused to allow the group to put a speaker on stage, not even Roman, who is a Democratic state lawmaker in Georgia, a key battleground state. They say, quote, the reality of the situation is that we genuinely are asking for the bare minimum, said Roman. This was a symbolic gesture. This was supposed to be something that we could take back and say, look, the party is listening. Okay, so again, they're not trying to get up there and say Kamala Harris is a war criminal. She's complicit in genocide. She should be tried at The Hague. They're getting up there to endorse Kamala Harris. And just to do a gesture, they're asking for a gesture towards the Palestinian movement towards the uncommitted voters, just to say, okay, we see you, we hear you, which is so far below the bare minimum that it's insane. And they couldn't even meet that bare minimum. They say before the uncommitted movement learned that they would not have a chance to speak, its leaders were, quote, heartened because we saw that families of Israeli hostages were invited onto stage. So we thought, okay, this is it. And on Thursday, Mother Jones published a draft of the speech that Roman hoped to deliver. In it, she talks about the devastation of being a moral witness to the massacres in Gaza. But this pain, she writes, I've also witnessed something profound, a beautiful multi-faith, multi-racial, and multi-generational coalition rising from despair within the Democratic Party. She continues, for 320 days, we've stood together demanding to enforce our laws on friend and foe alike to reach a ceasefire, the end of the killing of Palestinians, free all the Israeli and Palestinian hostages, and to begin the difficult work of building a path to collective peace and security. That's why we are here. Members of this Democratic Party committed to equal rights and dignity for all. What we do here echoes around the world. And they, she also went on to say that, you know, they had this guy former Georgia Lieutenant Governor Duncan, who spoke on Wednesday, and Duncan, who's a Republican, also, by the way, op opposes abortion. So apparently the Democratic Party has room for anti-abortion Republicans, but doesn't have room for a pro-Kamala, pro-Democrat, you know, Palestinian American. They don't have room for that, but they have room for an anti-abortion Republican to speak at their convention. I mean, they continue. They say, Roman intended to endorse Vice President Kamala Harris in her speech. She said, let's commit to each other to electing Vice President Kamala Harris and defeating Donald Trump, who uses my identity as a Palestinian, as a slur. So again, it was an endorsement of Kamala Harris, right? They're not even asking for anything. They're not even really saying, if you don't allow us to do X, Y, Z, or if you don't cut off weapons to Israel, we're going to vote for Trump, or we're not going to vote, or we're going to vote third party. They're not even saying that. They're saying, we want you to vote for Kamala Harris. We just want to be heard. That's what they're saying. They're saying, look, this guy, Donald Trump over there, is using the word Palestinian as a slur to attack Democrats. So we don't want him to be in office. We just want to know that you potentially could have the, the capacity to break from where Joe Biden was as a hardline Zionist when it comes to the issue of Israel and Gaza. And they could not even meet this pathetically low bar. That's what it is. I mean, if we're being honest, it's a pathetically low bar. Again, the demand wasn't let us get them on stage and demand an arms embargo. The demand wasn't let us get up on stage and talk about the history of decades of Israeli occupation of Palestinians or that there's a genocide going on that has been fueled by Democrats who have been in positions of power. That wasn't the demand. The demand was let us get up on stage, voice some of our concerns, you know, endorse Kamala Harris, attack Donald Trump. Those were the demands. And they couldn't even fucking do that. How pathetic is that? You had all these different coalitions you allowed to speak up on stage, but not a Palestinian American. It, it's honestly just, like, even just from a political perspective, putting the moral part of it aside, just from a political perspective, it's pathetic and it's a fumble. I mean, this was an easy, an easy victory. If anything, I think there's a critique here that the uncommitted movement wasn't going hard enough, that they weren't saying outright, you know, if you don't give us X, Y, Z, or if you don't change policy on X, Y, Z, then we are all hundreds of thousands of us not going to vote for you, right? Right. If anything, you could say this speech was too easy on Kamala Harris. It was too easy on the Democratic Party. So if they had allowed her to get up on stage to give this speech, first off, it would have been widely well-received at the DNC. It would have been well-received by the Democratic voter base, which as a reminder, a majority of whom think that what Israel is doing in Gaza is a genocide, a vast majority of whom think that we should cut off weapons to Israel, right? 
a vast majority of whom who for months now have wanted a ceasefire, it would be popular. It would be a popular thing to do. It would win you votes and would cost you absolutely nothing. And they still couldn't bring themselves to fucking do it. I mean, it's just pathetic. Now, in terms of what Kamala Harris actually said during this speech in regards to Israel and Gaza, here's a clip from Ken Klippenstein who put it together. Let's go ahead and watch this. I have it on 1.25 times speed. Let's see if Kamala Harris is going to break from the Biden administration at all when it comes to this issue. With respect to the war in Gaza, President Biden and I are working around the clock because now is the time to get a hostage deal and a ceasefire deal done. And let me be clear, and let me be clear, I will always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself, and I will always ensure Israel has the ability to defend itself, because the people of Israel must never again face the horror that a terrorist organization called Hamas caused on October 7, including unspeakable sexual violence and the massacre of young people at a music festival. At the same time, what has happened in Gaza over the past 10 months is devastating. So many innocent lives lost. Desperate, hungry people fleeing for safety over and over again. The scale of suffering is heartbreaking. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. Okay, so first off, again, this was probably the loudest applause that Kamala got throughout the entirety of her like 40 or so minute speech was during that portion when she was talking about Palestinian self-determination. Now, whether or not she actually believes in fighting for that is a completely different question, and I'm not convinced at all in the slightest that she is, right? We don't even hear the Biden administration. We don't hear Kamala Harris talk about a decades-long occupation or that Israel is illegally occupying the West Bank and that they have kept Gaza under a uh, you know years-long siege at this point well before October 7th. We don't even hear them talk about that kind of stuff. So the idea that you are fighting for Palestinian self-determination to me is a little bit ridiculous because Israel right now, partially at least with the weapons and the support that the U.S. is giving them, is expanding their illegal settlements into the West Bank. They are making a two-state solution impossible Possible and more impossible as the days go on, right? So I find it a little bit hard to believe that you're actually working towards that. Another part of it is, again, she says we're working tirelessly for a ceasefire. This was something that was echoed by AOC, who basically said word for word the exact same thing. She was later called out by Ilhan Omar for saying that, and I'll show you that clip here in a second. But guys, the notion that the Biden administration is working tirelessly for a ceasefire is just bullshit. That's just what it is, because number one, they haven't been, okay? But number two, more importantly, you don't have to work tirelessly for a ceasefire negotiation. Israel does not want a ceasefire in Gaza. We've seen this over and over again for months and months and months at this point. They want to be able to continue the war. That is the main sticking point in these ceasefire negotiations, is that Israel doesn't want it to be a ceasefire. They don't want it to be a lasting ceasefire, period. They've, open, they've been very open about this for a very long time. And so you don't need to work tirelessly for a ceasefire. What you need to do is to use your leverage as the most powerful country on earth, the you know predominant military supplier for Israel's genocide in Gaza. What you need to do is to cut off the weapons to Israel. That's what you need to do. First step, that's, that's step number one. And by the way, as a reminder, that not only would be the morally and politically correct thing to do, but legally, that is an obligation that the United States has. The weapons we are sending to Israel are completely illegal, not only under international law, but also under U.S. domestic law with the Leahy Law and the Foreign Assistance Act. We're in complete violation of our own laws in sending weapons to Israel, knowing that they are using them to engage in the widespread obliteration of innocent men, women, and children and civilian infrastructure. So, no, you're not working tirelessly for a ceasefire. If you wanted a ceasefire, you know what step number one is? Stop sending them the fire, okay? Stop sending them the weapons that they are using in Gaza. That's step number one. You want a ceasefire? Well, cease the firing. Cease sending them the fire. Step number one. 
But we can't even get that. We can't even get that. And again, notice how it's surrounded by, when it comes to Hamas, right? She has no issue whatsoever in condemning the violence from Hamas. She brings up the mass sexual assault on October 7th claim, which has been widely debunked, and then somehow also forgets the fact that even just within the last couple of weeks, we saw documented evidence, video evidence, of Palestinians who are being tortured, including sexual torture, at Steed Timon in the Negev Desert in Israel by the IDF. Sexual torture of Palestinians. No mention for that, but you have time to mention the widely debunked mass sexual assault on October 7th stuff. So you mentioned that stuff. You mentioned, you know, Hamas is, is this brutal terrorist organization and they attacked innocent civilians. But then when it comes to Gaza, it's like as if a, a natural disaster occurred. It's as if an earthquake hit Gaza. And somehow now you can't ascribe blame, right? You can ascribe blame to Hamas for October 7th, but not Israel in anything that has happened for almost 11 months now at this point inside of Gaza. Somehow now there's no critique there for the actual responsible party in that violence, in the suffering. What's happening in Gaza is not just like heartbreaking. It's not some tragedy. It's an active choice that you are making. That's what it is. You have the power, you have the leverage to stop what is happening in Gaza, and you are choosing not to do it. So this speech to me was awful. It was terrible, and to me it showed she's basically going to follow in line with exactly what the Biden administration policy was. I know there's been some hope there that maybe she'll break away from the Biden administration. Maybe there's a chance for something different there. But based on what I've seen, it doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like it. And I'll link this down below. I don't want to play through the entire speech again, but this was pointed out by Z Squirrel. You can do a side-by-side -side comparison. And, and they do that in this video that'll be in the description below on what Kamala said in her speech versus what Joe Biden has been saying for months at this point. It's basically word for word, the exact same thing word for word, the exact same thing. So I wouldn't expect anything different from Kamala. Now, you had some people who were responding to this saying, you know, here we had Matthew Sheffield, who said like, she did it, Kamala called for a ceasefire while also saying she believes in Israel's right to defend itself and also uh, properly called Hamas a terrorist organization. She balanced it also by honoring the victims in Gaza as well. Perfectly done, perfectly done, perfectly done. I don't want you to honor the victims of Gaza. I want you to stop killing them. That's what, that's what people are asking for. We don't, we don't want you to say that it's a tragedy and that it's heartbreaking. I could give a shit if you think it's heartbreaking. I want you to stop sending weapons to the people who are killing children. That's what I want. I don't give a shit how you feel about it. I don't care if it, it keeps you up at night. It should, but I don't care if it keeps you up at night. I want you to actually change policy when it comes to this issue. But you have people who are just so gullible. They're like, oh, she, she gave a gesture to the Palestinian suffering. She doesn't mention who's causing the suffering, namely Israel and the United States. She doesn't mention that, but she, she gives a gesture. Oh, it's, it's, isn't it so horrific? Isn't it so sad? I mean, Jesus Christ, man, what are we doing here? And by the way, again, the biggest blockade for a ceasefire and getting the hostages back to Israel is Israel. It's been that way for months at this point. That's not a secret. Benjamin Netanyahu has been sabotaging these ceasefire negotiations. He wants to keep himself in power. And to keep himself in power, he has to keep the war going. The second that the war ends, his coalition falls apart. He's in jeopardy of losing his position of power. He could end up in jail because of the corruption charges that he's set to face inside of Israel. He needs to keep this genocide going. He needs to expand the war to potentially include Hezbollah and the Houthis and Iran and elements in Iraq and Syria. That's what Benjamin Netanyahu wants. So to just gesture at a ceasefire and Israel has a right to defend themselves, even though that's clearly not what they're doing. I mean, it's just fucking pathetic, man. It's just pathetic. Now, we also had here, as a reminder, just to give you guys like a comparison, because people are pretending as if what Kamala said is some sort of like a, a revelatory thing. It's a new thing to say Palestinians have a right to self-determination. I mean, this was Obama speaking to Israelis, to Israelis back in 2013, over a decade ago. He said this, he said, but the Palestinian people's right to self-determination, their right to justice must also be recognized. Put yourself in their shoes. Look at the world through their eyes. It is not fair that a Palestinian child cannot grow up in a state of their own, living their entire lives within the presence of a foreign army that controls the movements, not just of those young people, but their parents, their grandparents every single day. 
It's not just when settler violence against Palestinians goes unpublished. It's not right to prevent Palestinians from farming their lands or restricting a student's ability to move around in the West Bank or displace Palestinian families from their homes. Neither occupation nor expulsion is the answer. Just as Israelis built a state of their, in their own homeland, Palestinians have a right to be a free people in their own land. Guys, this is significantly to the left of anything that I've heard from Biden or Kamala Harris. So the idea that Kamala is taking some sort of a left-wing stance on Palestine Guys, she's not even to the left of, like, Obama. She's arguably not even to the left of George W. Bush or Ronald Reagan, who were more willing to be to have open conversations about the illegal occupation of Palestinians, right? I mean, Ronald Reagan used his leverage as president to force Israel, within a matter of minutes, to stop bombing Gaza, or to stop bombing uh, uh, Lebanon, right, in Beirut, back in the 80s. Ronald Reagan got on the phone with Benin, and... and and, or begin and, and fucking within 20 minutes had him stop the bombing. He called it a holocaust at the time. So the idea that it's anything new, it's anything, you know, left wing or, or notable that Kamala said, if anything, it's to the right of where the previous standards were. We've shifted so far to the right on the issue of Israel that now even just like gesturing at a two state solution is somehow a big deal. It's not a big deal. This has been the baseline position of the United States for decades at this point. And it's been a hollow, a hollow position, a hollow gesture that they never intended on actually following through on. Now, to show you guys a little bit of what the, the platform here is, I mean, this was something that, that as pointed out here by Prem, who I actually got to meet in person when I was in Chicago. Shout out to Prem. He does great work. And he points this out about the a Kamala Harris administration in the future. They say, a Kamala Harris administration will not cut or condition U.S. security assistance to Israel, her former aide says during a panel on the sidelines of the DNC. Jewish American Council uh, of America CEO Haley Seufer, who previously served as Harris's national security advisor in the Senate, notes that the Biden-Harris administration has approved more aid to Israel in the past six months than any other administration ever. Also speaking on this panel, organized by the American Jewish Committee, is Representative Brad Schneider, who said that he spoke yesterday with the Harris campaign's new Jewish outreach chief, Ilan Goldberg, who assured him that the Democratic Party's presidential nominee would oppose a return to the Iran nuclear deal. So now, apparently, it's the baseline Kamala Harris position that not only is she against a potential arms embargo or restricting weapons to Israel as they continue with the genocide, but apparently the Democratic Party is now against the Obama-Iran nuclear deal. That's how far right we have spun on the issue of Israel just over the last couple of years. I mean, that's total insanity. Now, we also had some other uh, notable lines here from Kamala's speech. This was this one was insane. Let's go ahead and listen to like five seconds of this because this this like actually made me almost throw up when I heard it the first time. As commander in chief, I will ensure America always has the strongest, most lethal fighting force in the world. The most lethal fighting force in the world. Now, let me ask you guys. Do you guys want the most lethal fighting force in the world? Or do you want something like, I don't know, affordable housing and universal health care and the ability to go to college without taking on mountains of debt? I mean, what do you guys want? Do you want a lethal military or do you want like basic social needs met for the American people? I think I know where I stand on that issue. This is completely insane, guys. A Democratic presidential nominee is talking about having the most lethal military force in the world? Lethal to who? To Palestinian babies? Sure, okay, you've already kind of succeeded on that. Lethal to where? What 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 wars are we pre preparing for? War with Iran? War with China? War with anybody? I mean, what are we doing here, guys? This is something you would hear from, like, a Republican. This is insane. Now, we also had as a reminder, again, Ilhan Omar doing a sh short little call out here for something that AOC said during her speech at the DNC. Let's listen to this. So if you really wanted a ceasefire, you just stop sending the weapons. It is that simple. And it literally is that simple. Six second clip there, Ilhan Omar just completely, you know, summed it up. And she was calling out Ilhan, uh, or she was calling out uh, AOC earlier as a part of this speech that she was giving, because during her speech, AOC said, you know, the Kamala Biden administration is working tirelessly for a ceasefire. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? No, they're not. No, they're not. It's this simple. It's exactly as Ilhan just pointed out there. You want a ceasefire, stop sending the weapons. 
That's it. That's like step number one. We should have done that a long fucking time ago. That's the easiest part of this entire process towards getting a ceasefire. It should be the easiest. So to, to get up there, man, I mean, it's just so disappointing from somebody like AOC to get up on stage and to say they're working tirelessly for a ceasefire. No, the fuck they're not. You should know that. Of course they're not. So shout out to Ilhan Omar and also Rashida Tlaib. Now, a couple other things and we'll finish off the video. We had a uh, new footage that came out. I'll put this on mute here. So this was put out by the uh, Quds News Network. They say shocking footage exclusively published by Al Jazeera shows that Israeli occupation forces are detonating the ancient greater mosque in Khan Yunus. So the reason I bring this up is because, listen guys, look at this exp explosion here. That was not an airstrike, okay? Not an airstrike. That was a controlled demolition, a controlled demolition of a mosque in Khan Yunus. So a controlled demolition means that you're not in the middle of a fight. It means that you're not doing an airstrike where you're trying to target where you think some Hamas militants or, you know, military capabilities may be. This means that you went into this place, a mosque, right? A religious, a holy site. You went into this place, you rigged it with explosives, you stepped back, and then you blew it up. What is the military objective here, right? What is the justification for this? There is no justification. The explanation for this is that what Israel has been doing in Gaza is not some targeted war against Hamas. It's not to free the hostages or whatever the fuck else. What they are doing in Gaza is part of a decades-long project to physically, culturally, religiously destroy the Palestinian people. That's what this is. And that's what this looks like. You're doing a controlled demolition of a mosque in Khan Yunus, not to mention the dozens of other mosques that they bombed or destroyed. I mean, the churches, the hospitals, the schools, the UN shelters, the refugee camps, the housing, the farmland, the water infrastructure, the aid workers you've targeted, the journalists that you've targeted. There's no explanation for this other than it's a genocide. And it's, it's one of the most obvious genocides in the history of humanity. And yet we live in a country where our supposed left-wing political party is not only unwilling to call it what it is and is unwilling to follow in accordance with international law or U.S. law and to stop funding and arming the genocide, but we'll defend it. I mean, that's what, that's what we're doing here. Now, again, none of this is to say Republicans are better. They're not. Trump would be worse. He would be. I know that it's like unimaginable to think, well, what could be worse than this? And to some extent, that's true. But it's also true that when it comes to Israel, Trump is even more in the pocket than somebody like Kamala Harris. He is, straight up. This is a guy who did the Abram Accords. This is a guy who moved the embassy to Jerusalem. This is a guy who recognized their illegal occupation of the Golan Heights. This is a guy who, if Israel nuked the Gaza Strip entirely and wiped out 2 million people, he wouldn't give a shit. He wouldn't even do the pretend, you know, the, the pretend sophistry, the pretend gestures to caring about the suffering in Gaza. He wouldn't even bother to do that. So somehow in this country where we have, you know, massive lobbying groups who have hundreds of millions of dollars to dump into elections, somehow we have two political parties who are entirely in the pocket of a foreign government. That foreign government is Israel. There's basically no other country on earth where this applies, right? There are other, you know, issues of corruption, like the Saudis and their connection to the Trumps. You know, you had Jared Kushner who got a couple billion dollars from the Saudis on his way out after they gave them a bunch of weapons and did their bidding, etc. There, there's plenty of corruption from foreign governments, but I, I seriously can't think of another country around the world where you cannot even criticize them if you are a mainstream politician. You can't criticize them. You can't talk about them in a negative light. You can't assign blame to them. You, you're not to mention daring to cut off weapons to them or to sanction them or to follow international law in regards to them. Israel is just this extremely unique situation where they can do whatever the fuck they want and the U.S. will do absolutely nothing about it. We would put France into check. We would put Germany into check. We would put Australia into check. Even some of our closest allies, we would flex our power over them to get them to do our bidding. But when it comes to Israel, somehow we're powerless. Most powerful country on the face of the planet. Somehow we have no leverage over Israel to stop what they are doing. And by the way, it's not even in our benefit, the trajectory that we're on right now. Israel is seemingly hell-bent. Benjamin Netanyahu is hell-bent on potentially dragging the United States into a broader regional war with Iran and Hezbollah and the Houthis and elements in Iraq and Syria. This is not even beneficial to our own like national security interests or whatever. Israel is a terrible ally 
objectively a terrible ally that is detrimental to the interest of the American people. And somehow, nothing can be done about this. Nothing can be done about this. We've had the protests, we had the uncommitted votes, we've had, we've had everything. What the fuck do people do moving forward? If you're an anti-genocide voter, what do you do moving forward? Do you go with Kamala Harris because maybe you can make a plausible argument that she's slightly the lesser of two evils when it comes to this issue? Do you vote third party and for somebody like Jill Stein who actually has a principled stance on this? Do you not vote at all because you're so demoralized at how corrupt and rotten to its core American politics has become? What do people do? I don't know. You guys tell me. Now, we also had, of course, it's pointed out here by Rashida Tlaib, apparently a 10-month-old baby inside of Gaza. Um... 10 months old, which means, as pointed out here by Prem, she was a child born into war, whose only experience in life is war, and has become paralyzed from war because she has gotten polio. There's now a polio outbreak, something that we had thought as a global community we could have moved past, that we had largely eradicated polio as a disease. And the conditions inside of Gaza has, have become so awful that now we have a return of polio to the Gaza Strip, where people do not have access to reliable clean drinking water, reliable food, reliable medical care. This is a disaster. It's a complete and utter fucking disaster. And even just putting it that way is an understatement. So there you go. I'm sure I'll have some some more coverage moving forward on this um, in terms of the DNC, in terms of Kamala Harris, in terms of Israel and Gaza. But it's not looking good, guys. It's really not looking good. You know, I wish I could sit here and say that Kamala is going to be a, a real break from the Biden administration and give her a chance and, you know, she'll work it out. But based on what I've seen, based on her statements, based on her speech, based on everything, it just unfortunately doesn't seem that way. Politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me, everyone is saying things.